So I'm speaking with composer Leslie Barber, whose talents and versatility has brought us memorable scores to films such as Hysterical Blindness, uh, Mansfield Park, uh, You Can Count On Me, and recently the critically acclaimed Manchester by the Sea. Uh, Leslie, thanks so much for your, for your time tonight for speaking this evening. Hey, Kaya. Nice to uh, meet you. Yeah, absolutely. So to start, I'd love to um, kind of know your journey to film composing. So how did music uh, enter your life and what was kind of the catalyst that kind of focused your path uh, to writing for music and television? Or for, sorry, for, for film and television. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I started writing music when I was a kid and um, pretty much self-taught. Uh, I came from a really musical family. Um, so if I wanted to learn how to play something or compose something, I got some sort of help, you know, figuring out notation, that sort of thing. Uh, and then um, took some lessons and, you know, did the normal schooling um, while I was doing my master's degree in my early 20s, like 22, I started, I had to support myself uh, financially because my parents thought that would be a character building exercise. <laughs> and <laughs> instead of getting a job, you know, that was mundane, I, I ended up writing music for theater oh, wow. uh, and, and lots of theater productions. And, and um, because I was a huge theater fan and a f huge Cine cinephile at that, at that point, point as well. So um, I was writing for independent theater and independent filmmakers were, were hearing my work and started asking me to compose for their films. And, and yeah, and so in the 90s, I started scoring feature films and a series and really enjoyed it. I just thought, wow, this is fantastic. I found my niche yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, more work came my way. That's awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, were there any kind of specific styles of music or maybe, I guess, musicians or composers or even filmmakers that you kind of gravitated towards growing up? Um, well, I, I do remember seeing, you know, the, the Terrence Malick films and really, um, really loving those and yeah. and the way music was used in those films and um and also I, I liked films where the music was almost like a character like um goldfinger um mm. shaft um you know some of those those sorts of films um growing up and then as I, you know, developed more and started, I, I really liked, you know, going to a lot of indie films and seeing how, you know, it's kind of interesting because there's that whole lush sort of um, cinematic experience and it's got, there's a certain language that goes with that. And then there's independent voices. And so I would say that um, just hearing that interaction was, was really important to me. Uh -huh. So for yeah, so for speaking of like music as a character, I think Manchester by the Sea definitely fulfills that kind of uh, uh, description. So you got to reconnect with uh, writer director Kenneth Lonergan, uh, who also did you uh, can you can count on me, which you also scored. So when you work with the director again, is it kind of like a continuation of the last time you guys worked together, or does it feel like a completely new thing built being built from the ground up again? Um. Well, with Kenny. It was great. I mean, I really felt like, well, I'd seen them over in uh, over the um, years in between, um, I think a couple of times and, and so on. And we were aware of each other's work, but, you know, it was interesting because You Can Count On Me was an, an early film for both of us. Right. And, you know, um, since then I've worked with a lot of different people. He's worked on a lot with a lot of different projects. So it was really interesting um, to look back and see, uh, that there were there were indications of where um, our collaboration would go when, in our first um, collaboration. Um, for instance, you know, with Kenny, the first time we collaborated, we we really were patient uh, until we felt we found the right theme, uh, mm. Terry's theme, and we found the right palette and we found the right performance practice for the the instruments and, and this sort of thing. And I would say. Um, coming back and working together this time, um, you know, our, uh, we both evolved and our choices were, we could make, we could just jump from that point and make really strong choices and, um, and uh, make bold choices. And, and also, you know, you have that trust there. Right, so, right. you know, I could, I could actually take the time 
to develop themes and record them and just know that if I spend a couple of days working on a piano solo or recording the vocal pieces that 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 was that 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 it was it was it was okay to kind of go ahead and produce things mm-hmm. and send them to Kenny rather than a little tiny sketch and then leap of faith leap of faith you know right, it was right. the the, le- the leap of faith is from is from page one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when you first sat down uh, with him to uh, with to, to discuss kind of the musical approach for Manchester by the Sea, what were those kind of initial discussions about? What, what I guess what was the goal for the music for the role of the music in in this film? Well, we, we definitely, um, there was, there was a sense of restraint Mm -hmm. and we were both looking at, at what wasn't there and and what, and what was there, of course. And we wanted music that, that had a perspective and counterpoint to what was going on on screen. Um, I would say the score is partly by design and, and, and quite a bit intuitive as well. So for most of the ideas, it, 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 after I got the script, I, I could have an intuitive sort of um, collaboration with the script and come up with ideas that I just thought were right. Later, when Kenny and I discussed why they were right and why other ideas weren't right, you know, we could come up with the language and the schematic to describe why. But I would say from... From the first part of the in the, in in the in the early days, it was it was quite intuitive, mm. um, and so and then Kenny and I would get we got together in the editing room, um, and we would try different music, different pieces of music against picture, and we discovered that some of the music was working extremely well, like the a cappella pieces and and some of my piano solos, and then we developed the piece I developed the pieces further and, you know, added orchestrations and started writing more to picture but because there's a lot of classical pieces in there and there's a lot of music that is pre-existing i I really needed these pieces to sound like needle drops as well and to be quite quite well developed and and um have a sort of formal integrity to them so um I, i wrote a lot away from picture and then i wrote to picture as well that's yeah that's fascinating i think that always yields like a I don't know. I guess the. I know a lot of composers wish they could kind of work early on the film. You know, kind of write ideas before it starts shooting. And I know like Hans Zimmer works that way. And if you go all the way back to you know Sergio Leone and Morricone, they kind of worked similarly. Um, mm-hmm. Do you prefer being able to kind of work out ideas before seeing the picture? Yes, I do. Although it's it can be fascinating. Sometimes you'll write this uh, you know a theme that's in in response to the script and it just feels like magic it feels Mm -hmm. so connected and then you actually get the film and you realize that your theme is its soul is sort of redundant because it's already there in either the pacing or the atmosphere or the acting and so I I would I what's ideal is if it's sort of um, a two-chapter process where you can write to to script and then maybe go away and work on something else while the filmmaker's editing and then come back, you know, when you've got a fine cut yeah. and, um, and see what's working and what's not. So what, what, where did the, uh, I guess the, the inspiration came for that kind of acapella and the use of uh, vocals? I mean, it's usually, it's always, I find it very powerful when you can, kind of, when I hear vocals in film scores and in chorus or any kind of type of kind of that human aspect, where did the inspiration come for, for from this story? Well, it's funny. I when I was reading the script, I was just you know thinking about um, the fact that Lee uh, has experienced an unimaginable tragedy, and he's not miraculously bouncing back. His life is day to day. It's it's sort of one foot in front of the other, and um, and Kenny and I talked about creating music that's simple and big and slightly dark Mm -hmm. and kind of floats over top of the character's heads almost like fate you know it just sort of keeps going and is a counterpoint and and Kenny it it was funny he described it so beautifully he said you know that you know it's a simple melody with complicated harmonies um 
sort of like the uh, equivalent of including the sky in a shot, you know, and just sort of overhead. And um, so my connection to the script was I, I started thinking about the sense of place, this small Massachusetts town. And um, the idea that, I don't know, I just, when I was there uh, um, a few years ago, I just felt like I was in a, in a, in a place of a very old civilization, like most of the U.S. is. But <laughs> there was something about that place where you get the feeling of um, pilgrims and uh, Puritans who came over and started their life over again. And, and probably in a pretty post-traumatic way as well. Mm. And so I started listening to hymns and things like that that came over in the early 1600s and created sort of some loops that were elliptical and based on, well, not, they were kind of inspired by melodic fragments and this idea that I could create sort of almost a minimalist looping quality where the music could just keep going to infinity and you wouldn't be aware of the loop. So I started playing around with that idea and then started playing around with the idea of adding vocals to it and then started working with a singer really late one night who happens to be my daughter, who oh, wow. we set up a source connect and got some really amazing audio equipment set up. And um, I really wanted to send a demo to Kenny and it was like the middle of the night. So I got her to sort of, start layering some of my arrangement and it just sounded so cool and I sent it off to Kenny and it re he he um he didn't really comment that much at first but then he started putting it to picture and um because he was busy frankly it wasn't that he didn't like it right. he just was so yeah. busy so I and then and then he uh gave me a call and said you know how or, or wrote and said, you know, that it was working extremely well, and let's develop a few more pieces like that. So wow. that's sort of how those that idea came came about. That's fascinating. So I mean, and also I think the the subject of the film, of course, is very heavy. Um, when you're dealing with a kind of heavy subject matter, um, is finding the right tone was that a challenge? Was, is it is it easy, I guess, for the music to do too much in this case? Did you have to kind of find a, a line to straddle here? Well, I think, again, that it was all about counterpoint with this particular story and um, the, and creating music that that maybe isn't the kind of music that Lee would listen to even on the radio, mm -hmm. but is music that is sort of an extension of who he is and what he's going through um, in, a, in a kind of more um, intuitive way. So... That was interesting. I mean, at times you do hear, we, we do have pre-existing pieces that are in shared spaces with Lee. Like if he's in the car with someone else or if he's in the bar with someone else, we have music of place and time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in the other spots in the film, um, you know, we take away the sound, we take away the dialogue, and we let store we let the music tell another story and um, add another layer to the storytelling. So, right. um, yeah, it it, it it truly was a a, a kind of um, uh, exploration of counterpoint in this particular film. And you you did mention you know the use of. Uh pre-existing music and then kind of source music and needle drops and how you and you said that you wanted your music to feel similar to that but as a as a composer and i know a lot of composers have to navigate these waters sometimes when other music is already in there um do you try to complement i guess the, the the source music that's in there or do you kind of step around it to give it its its own space if that makes any sense yeah, I mean, I didn't want it to sound similar because, I mean, how could I... I didn't want anything remotely like pastiche or anything right, like right. that. But um, I, what is interesting in, in working with Kenny in both films is that it's not like other films where you don't know what the counter, what the uh, pre-existing is going to be because there's so many films that I work on and, you know, there's all this kind of there'll be like pop song or something in the yeah. tap and then right. and then they don't get the licensing for it and then it's it's gone and maybe it's <laughs> in the key of g flat and you've written something you know in the tritone away and suddenly it's sort of alarming when you hear it played back but right. i think in this particular case kenny and i were were um in 
in contact like a lot about these choices. So I could get the kind of sense of harmonic um, language, harmonic progression and rhythm and sort of overwhelming key structure. And even if I didn't sit and really think about it, um, I could write music that would um, unify, uh, complement, blend, counterpoint in a way that um, that by the end of the film, you know, the score is developed in a, in, a, in, a, in its own layering, but it's also accumulated language and energy and power from from these pre-existing. So I was aware of trying to build that kind of architecture for sure, mm. so that it it sounded. So it was all sort of one score. Right. And for sure with the performance practice, you know, in the beginning, there were, there were, there was a specific open, kind of opening up of the string sound and of the range. And, um, I mean, in, in a kind of Shankarian analysis way, sort of the, the bandwidth of melody and harmony and where you choose your lowest notes and your highest notes and how to kind of form those around the story. So fascinating. Um, so I mean, we did we were talk about the pre-existing music, not really part of the process here, but what happened, you know, it, it was in the news that your score got disqualified from Oscar contention <laughs> because of the yes. use of this. And I think it's so ridiculous just from my point of view is that how can there be a rule book about what is a score, what isn't a, I mean, the fact that you can try to confine how to make a film, I don't know, it just kind of baffles me. But I was just curious about, you know, as it's, you know, I know that recognition is nice, but it's not the motivation f- to do the work that you and other filmmakers and storytellers do. But when the news came out that your score was disqualified, what were your kind of thoughts and initial feelings behind that? Um, well, when I was writing the score, I wasn't thinking about awards or anything Yeah, exactly. Like that. It's so, never, never you know, <laughs> it, we were just trying to write the best score for this particular story. So um, I have never really thought about, like I really don't really think about that sort of thing. Uh Um, And so when it happened, um, what was, it was really interesting to see that there was a lot of energy around that story. Um, I, I think that, you know, um, I'm in good company. Um, yeah, absolutely. You're Sakamoto, <laughs> Nina Rota, <laughs> Johan, <laughs> Johnny Greenwood for "There Will Be Blood." Yeah, um, you know uh, the Birdman score. So, so that's that was comforting, and um, <laughs> it, it was also a curious thing because um, I, I do think that you know a lot of people can tell the difference between Handel and what I've written and, and distinguish about what score and what isn't, absolutely, but. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, I, I really respect what the Academy um, tries to do and um, um, it, what what they achieve with um, uh, creating a, a really supportive branch for the composers who are working in this field. Cool. So, yeah, just letting them know that you're open to being nominated in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, no, I'm actually not. I'm not open to it at all. <laughs> yes, um, I am. Yeah. Okay. So, kind of going back to your approach, and this could be not just for Manchester by the Sea, but for for any film or any show. Um, what's kind of the first thing that kind of uh, grabs you? I know you, you mentioned about looking at the script, but what's kind of the first thing about a story or the film that kind of pulls the first note out of you? Is it kind of the characters, the plot, the setting, the genre? Is there anything that really speaks to you louder than everything else? Hmm. Um, wow, that's such a big question. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I am. I, I. I mean, it's. It's. I. I do feel like I. I get very immersed in in the story, mm-hmm. and that I, I. I try to tap into what isn't there and what's at stake for characters and figure out how once I figured out what the characters are longing for and what's at stake for them to create something atmospheric and to also create something melodic and harmonic that somehow brings more depth to their story. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a pretty simple premise. And, um, 
I think in all my scores, there's a really hybrid approach, and and um, it it comes right down to the way you know you build the architecture of the sound and the palette of of the of the stylistic ingredients, you know. And it's I, I try to get out of out of the way um, of of the process and then look at it a little more seriously like the next day, <laughs> you know, and build from there. Yeah, that's good. That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's really a forum of feeling and, yeah, and, yeah. and, and how you get there is always, is always interesting. And it's, it's always different. Yeah. That's the thing. It's, it's different with every project. And I think that's the most fascinating part. Um, mm-hmm. So kind of looking over, you know, your job as a whole, you know, what is the most rewarding part of the composing process for you? Like what is like maybe your favorite or the one that kind of enriches you the most? Well, I mean, it it might sound banal, but it's just terribly exciting when you get it right. Mm -hmm. Um, And when, when, when you create something that, that, that even is surprising to yourself uh, and, and, and to your collaborators, that just fits in and, and brings the filmmaking to another level. Um, that's really exciting. It's it's the collaborative process is a thrill to me. Um, not only with the director, but with the producers and with everyone. And just looking at the limitations and the scope and the range of the project and the time limit and mm-hmm. and just kind of finding a way to master it all and create something beautiful and yeah. um, and and gorgeous. Um, the other exciting part is working with musicians and um, the thrill of, of getting together and, 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 and talking about the project and showing clips and writing the score and, and feeling their enthusiasm and how much they bring to the music. It's, it always blows me away with the, with the, with the collaborators I work with, um, um, what they all um, have their generosity and what they bring to projects. Absolutely. And uh, so kind of to wrap everything up, I always usually like to ask composers this this, this one question. Uh, if you could score any film ever made with no disrespect to the original composer and pretending like the original score never existed, which film would you choose? Mm, that's really, really <laughs> difficult. Um, What's the best playground that you would love to play in, I guess, is the kind of the, the, sco- the aim of the question. <laughs> <laughs> I really like sci-fi Ooh, and okay. um, dying to do something like that, you know. Um, something big and and kind of lush like Star Wars or kind of more intricate yeah. and... Blade Runner, oh, yeah. uh, Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> I, I shouldn't say this, with, uh, but I would have loved to have done Arrival. That would have been super oh, fun. Yeah. Um, you know, just looking at what... Um, Johan uh, did it was really cool and and it really got me thinking like what would I have done you know um, yeah that's fascinating um, but, but you would have been rejected I, the, for Oscar with that too so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I would have been right at home but um, the the the, the um, yeah I, I, creating uh, music um, for living on other planets and other uh, sorts of, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, kind of sci-fi worlds um, w- would be fascinating. And I would I would absolutely love to do that. Okay. Well, I love that answer. Well, uh, Leslie, thank you so much for your time tonight. It's been such a pleasure and fascinating to pick your brain for a little bit. And uh, congratulations on all the uh, success from Manchester by the Sea and, and the acclaim it's been getting. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure I can't wait to, to hear what comes next. <laughs> Thanks, Kai. I really appreciate it. It's been really wonderful speaking with you.